I'm a huge, huge believer that like one of the biggest drivers of inaction and of procrastination and of paralysis is intimidation. You look at it and you say like, oh my God, I'm sitting in my dead end job. Or I'm sitting in this dead end relationship or my health is suffering and I'm overweight and I cannot possibly envision the path to getting from here to being that fit person that I admire on Instagram, mm -hmm. to being that wealthy entrepreneur that I admire on Instagram, to being in that loving relationship that I admire wherever I've seen it in the world. And the reality is like, you don't go from point A to point B overnight. Mm -hmm. It's the tiny little steps. Welcome to the Jasmine Star Show. I couldn't be more excited to bring together two brilliant minds. As y'all know, I bring in guests, co-hosts, to help curate a powerhouse group of people. And one of those powerhouse groups of people is none other than Sawhill Bloom. But before we get there, I want to say welcome back to Jen Gottlieb, my amazing co-host here in Miami. The conversations have been very powerful. And as a reminder, if you're just tuning into this particular episode, the through line, AKA the theme of every single guest is focusing on, Jen, instead of me talking, yeah. you're my co-host, I'm gonna turn that over to you. Let's do it. When I thought about all of the guests that were coming today, the overarching theme when Jasmine asked me to think of like, what's the theme? What's, what, what's the connecting factor? It was everybody starts a little bit before they're ready. Every single person that we brought in had to take a risk, had to do something that maybe they weren't completely and totally crystal clear about. And they started with some fear, with some uneasiness, with some uncertainty and made some magic happen that maybe they didn't even realize was going to come out of it. So that's the theme, starting before you're ready. Starting before you're ready. And on that note, Sahil, I'm in an elevator going downstairs from this Miami sky rise and we go down and we have about eight floors together. What's your elevator pitch? Who are you and what do you do? Oh gosh, that's a hard question. I know I'm it is. I'm so Tough. bad at this, by the way. Well, oh. no, well, hold on, before we get there, before we get there, you're so bad at it because when I read your bio, I was like, are you freaking kidding me? His bio includes Condoleezza Rice. I know. You know, it's like all these awards and I went to Stanford and I'm just brilliant. And that was I'm like, like a PS at the yeah, end, the Condoleezza yeah, yeah, Rice yeah. thing. I was like, oh, oh, PS. and? Me and Condi, we're on a first name basis. Uh, Sahil, please, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank and you for having how me. How do we set the context and the framework for taking action before you're ready? Yeah, I, um, the reason I'm bad at this, by the way, is when you work in like a very traditional path, you have the like little one sentence intro of what you do. So I started my career in finance and I always had that, like it was very comfortable. You'd say like, oh, well, I'm a vice president at this firm. Like mm -hmm. I work in private equity, I'm doing this. And you had the like one line. And so going to any cocktail party or any event, people are like, what do you do? You have your little one line and then you move on from it. And it's super comfortable and you're confident in it. Leaving that to go do the thing that you're uncomfortable, like you're not ready for to yes. use your theme. One of the things that holds people back from that is you like, you don't know how to explain what you do. And that's so scary Amen. to like all of a sudden mm -hmm. feel like I don't have my little one liner that I can just give people where like, they're like, what do you do? I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know. I do like <laughs> 10 different things and I'm like really excited about this, which I actually don't do, but I'm hoping to do someday. It's like a really weird vibe. My whole bias when I was making the switch into my like current world, which we can talk about. From finance was, to your current world. Yeah, to like this new thing was, I would much rather sink as the captain of my ship than continue to thrive as a deckhand on someone else's. Mm. And that for me was just like my calling and my mantra of, I just wanna go and I'll figure it out. And like, there's this um, ancient Persian poet, Rumi, who said, as you begin to walk on the way, the way appears. And I've had that up on my wall for as long as I can remember because it's so true in my experience that like you have no idea what the path looks like. We all sit back and you like wanna create, okay, I'm gonna do this, 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 and this. I'm gonna create this perfect plan and this is exactly the path that I'm gonna go walk down. But you can't see the path until you begin walking it. And in everything that I've ever experienced in my life, and I would bet with both of you and on your entrepreneurial journeys, it's been the same. You didn't know what the way was until you started walking on the way. Mm -hmm. You had to just start moving and then you found it. So it was a super long-winded, not eight floor mm -hmm. elevator way. And I didn't even answer your question, mm -hmm. but that's how I'll open. So what is, <laughs> what do you say so if you had to say something? If I had to say something, what I would say is that my main focus is on creating positive ripples in the world. 
And I do that in a few different ways. One is through a venture fund where I invest in early stage technology companies. One is through a holding company of a bunch of businesses that broadly speaking help people augment, amplify their voice as an individual so that they can create ripples in the world. And then the third way is through my content, which is across basically any platform that you can have access to and an upcoming book that I'm excited about, which really is focused on helping people live slightly healthier, slightly wealthier lives. I love that you said slightly. Yeah. I love that because it's, it's, it's more actionable. It's more yeah. tangible. Yeah. My whole goal is like anything I put out into the world, I want it to be actionable and I want it to help you in some tiny way. Yeah. Like I think, I think the focus on like trying to get someone to create some dramatic change in their life is noble and great, but it's unrealistic because mm -hmm. when you read something that asks you to create some dramatic change, whatever the dramatic change is, 99% of people engage with that. They're like, oh, that sounds nice. And then they go back to living their normal life. Mm -hmm. But if you give someone something that's like the 1% change, that actually might be acted upon. They might go, if you tell them like, hey, go for a 15 minute walk today. Don't worry about like working out for three hours, go for a 15 minute walk. They might actually go do that. And that might turn into a 20 minute walk the next day or a 30 minute walk the next day. And then all of a sudden their entire life has changed and you were the like tiny little drop that created that ripple effect. Mm -hmm. And so like when I say ripples, that's what I mean by it. It's like, how can you be that tiny thing that creates this ripple out in the world? Mm. I love it. Can we go back to the quote that you live by? I'd rather be a captain on, I'd rather go down being the captain of my own ship than the deckhand on somebody else's. Can I read something that uh, you had said on an Instagram Please. reel? Okay. You said your entire life can change in one year, not five, not 10. And so as we start this, there are a lot of people, I would venture to say 99.9% .9 of the people who are watching and listening right now, they desperately want to be the captain of their own ship, but they have a hard time looking at a timeline and not being beholden or believing that if it doesn't, if it's not executed in their timeline, that they will have not succeeded, they will be perceived a failure. So let's just go back when you said that tiny little ripple, one year, when you talk about changing your life in one year, like this podcast listeners, listen, I'll, I'll live and die by these folks. They take action. Mm -hmm. So somebody wants to look at one year to say, I want to be a captain. What do I do? 30 minutes today on something that you're interested in. I, I, I'm a huge, huge believer that like one of the biggest drivers of inaction and of procrastination and of paralysis is intimidation. You look at it and you say like, oh my God, I'm sitting in my dead end job. Or I'm sitting in this dead end relationship or my health is suffering and I'm overweight and I cannot possibly envision the path to getting from here to being that fit person that I admire on Instagram, mm -hmm. to being that wealthy entrepreneur that I admire on Instagram, to being in that loving relationship that I admire wherever I've seen it in the world. And the reality is like, you don't go from point A to point B overnight. Mm -hmm. It's the tiny little steps mm -hmm. that happen along the way. It's those tiny little actions that you take. And so that bias has to come from doing the one little thing today. And I always say this, that like, you are always just one positive decision away from being in a slightly better place than you are today. Mm. And again, it's one small decision. Like you don't need to worry about the hundred thousand decisions that are going to happen over the next year. You just need to worry about this one. There's this scene. Um, have you seen the movie, the Martian? Uh, it's like Matt, Damon, Matt Damon. He's stuck oh, on Mars. Movie, it's, whole know, you know, it's, it's all about space. It's like this crazy sci-fi movie. But at the very end of it, there's this amazing scene that I'm obsessed with where he's talking to, like he's giving a lecture about how he got home from Mars. Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> and um, he basically says, here's how it works. You solve one problem and then you solve another one and then you solve another one. And when you've solved, en solved enough problems, you may get to come home. And he's talking about it in the context of surviving some traumatic event. But that thing, like that distilled idea of like, just solve the one problem, which is mm. the action today. Don't worry about the thousand actions that it's going to take after that. Solve mm. the one thing, then solve another one, then solve another one. Matthew McConaughey talks about it as like, do one in a row. He mm -hmm. talked about it in his book, Green mm -hmm. Lights. Just do one in a row. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a great thing for like people coming back from addiction. You're like, just one day in a row, yeah, just yeah. one day of sobriety, then another day, then another day stacking days. Like if you can just do that, the one tiny thing that pushes mm -hmm. you in the right direction, after a hundred days of that, you'll be transformed. It's not, it's not even like it's going to take five years. That's why I said that on Instagram of 
you can change your life in one year because it's so tangible. I can see a year from now. 10 years from now is hard for me to see. Five mm -hmm. years from now is hard for me to see. A year from now, if I do this one thing every single day, is my life going to be in a much better spot after doing that for a year? Hell yes, it is. So I'm going to start doing that. Like just take on the day, take on the next day, take on the next mm -hmm. day and let it, let it compound. A question that I get asked a lot, and I would love to hear your take on this, is about consistency and how to stay consistent when you feel like you're doing the thing. Like let's say you start to pick up a habit and you're like, I'm gonna do this for 30 minutes a day every yeah. single day. I'm gonna do it every day and they're doing it every day and a year goes by and nothing has really changed for them as mm -hmm. far as getting to that goal that they desire. Mm -hmm. What would you say about like patience, consistency and when do you throw in the towel and shift gears and pivot yeah. or when do you keep going and doing the thing that you're hoping is gonna get you to that big goal? Yeah, so there is like a narrative fallacy, I would say, around people that have pounded their head into a wall for years and years and then eventually succeeded. We like hold those stories up as examples of why we should all pound our heads into a wall on whatever the thing is, right? You're like, oh, well, that actor or actress didn't get a role for 10 years. They were still strong. And then they got their big break. And so mm -hmm. like that is then celebrated as the thing of like, you should do that. So if you're struggling and you're not making it and whatever it is you're doing, just like keep pounding your head into a wall because yeah. you eventually make it. That's just survivorship bias, right? Like we're ignoring all the people that pounded their head into a wall <laughs> for 10 years and then never made it. And so the lesson there is it's not about pounding your head into a wall. It's about getting slightly better at how you pound your head into the wall each time you do it, right? Like if I walk <laughs> over to that brick wall over there and I start hitting it with my head and I do it like 10 days in a row and I'm planning to do it for as long as it takes. If after like 10 days, I haven't seen a single budge or chip in the wall, I might want to start thinking about whether there's a different spot on the wall that I should try. Cause maybe mm -hmm. that spot is like not the right place. And so I use that analogy because that's what you need to do, right? Like it's not about just the consistency. It's also about getting slightly smarter at where you're applying your leverage, like where you're applying that energy and effort. And so if you're not after 30, 60 days seeing any tiny little glimmer of progress on what your main thing is, maybe you need to like make the tweak, reevaluate, yeah. like what's the slightly different version of this that I can approach it around. And that I think is where a lot of people will see like, the sudden surge is from just like, think about how you can get slightly smarter at the thing you're doing each day that you go after mm, it. Slightly smarter. And on, slightly. on that note, we, when Jen is talking about consistency and you're talking about the brick wall and finding a different spot to hit your head, if that is your <laughs> objective. I, I thought that it. was beautiful. It was yeah. like very visual to yeah. me. And yeah. I'm like, how many times have I actually cognizantly paused and said, you're gonna keep on hitting your head against the wall. Can you do it slightly different? Mm -hmm. um, you also had mentioned um, a description of deferred happiness. Um, when I think about consistency, when I think about pounding my head against the bricks, when I think about my, my, voluntarily, like, my voluntary decision, I'm gonna do this. Can you explain what is happening from the deferred happiness? Like, I'm not that happy b banging my head against the wall. Yeah, well, it helps when you enjoy the thing. When, when you enjoy the pounding of your head into the wall, you've like really found it. Because then <laughs> if I'm willing to pound my head into that wall for a decade, I'm just probably not gonna lose. Like if I get slightly smarter at it each and every time, like you're gonna have a really tough time beating me if I'm enjoying pounding my head into that wall. So like <laughs> when you find the thing that you're happy pounding your head into the wall on, you've like really, and probably most people don't ever find that in their life. So when you found that, just like savor it and mm -hmm. really embrace that. But the biggest thing is like all great things in life come from delayed gratification, from like the ability to say, I know that the thing I want is on the other side of something that sucks. Bottom line, every single thing you want in life is on the other side of something that sucks. Mm -hmm. Everything, like the body you want is on the other side of a hundred workouts that are really hard. The relationship you want is on the other side of a hundred really hard conversations mm -hmm. with the person that you care about. The job you want, the business you want to build, it's on the other side of hundreds of hours of really challenging work. You have to be willing to endure that in order to get the thing you want. Knowing that going in is the most powerful thing because you're not expecting it to be easy. You're not expecting it to be like, oh, here, I've been handed this incredible life. I've been handed this incredible relationship, this incredible purpose. Nothing in life that you actually should value should come easy. There's no seven easy payments of 1999 for like an amazing relationship with a partner, for an amazing relationship with your kids, for an amazing business where you feel a ton of purpose around it. That doesn't exist. And if someone tells you it does, you should run in the other direction because it's BS. And so I just like, this fires me up a lot because 
it's something that I think about constantly is like, how can I just endure this a little bit longer? How can I just embrace this hard, quote unquote, of whatever it is that I'm going through? And the beautiful thing about life is that you get to choose your hard. And I've said this mm -hmm. countless times, everything in life is hard, but you get to choose what your heart is. It's really hard to build an incredible body and physique. It's also really hard to see your body completely fail you because you haven't used it, but you get to choose which heart. Mm -hmm. like, it's really hard to build meaningful relationships. It's also really hard to live on the surface with a bunch of people. Yeah. Again, you get to choose your heart. It's really hard to live a life of purpose, working on something you care about. It's also really hard to live without purpose. So you get to choose which hard you're pursuing. You get to choose the thorns that you're gonna have on the path of your journey. Would you say that we get better at doing hard things the more that we practice doing hard things? Like I see yes. you in your cold plunge, yeah. I see you. I do the same thing, yeah. so I used to hate it, and now I do ice baths every yeah. Saturday to practice being uncomfortable so that I know that the next time something hard comes around, I'm like, I got this. Do you see that proof of concept the more that you do it? Because people don't like doing hard things. How do we get better at doing hard things. Yeah, I mean, we live in a world that, if you look at like the last 20 years, technology has progressively sucked the friction out of our lives, like everything. If you think yeah. about any technology that exists, its main purpose, if it has succeeded, has been in reducing friction in your daily existence. Like Uber has made it much easier to get around. Instacart has made it easier to get your groceries. You don't have to go talk to anybody. Amazon has made it easier for me to get whatever I want at any point in time without having to interact with a single human being. All of the, you know, dating apps. I, I'm not in the dating scene, but like, you don't have to go talk to a girl at a bar. Like, all my friends that are in the dating, like, I don't have to go through the discomfort of like putting myself out there to go up to a stranger at the bar and strike up a conversation. I can just like swipe left, right, whatever. So, we've reduced all this friction in our lives. And somewhere along the way, we have to have realized that like the friction was actually what created texture and meaning. Yeah. And something has to give there. There, there, there's a pendulum that has swung too far towards this frictionless existence where you're like, oh, actually maybe the friction was what created value and created meaning in our lives. And so my calling has been on helping people realize that you can strategically reinsert friction via these hard things into mm -hmm. your life. And the cold plunge is like one of the trendy examples right. that people have gone after, but it's no different than like, choosing to walk the stairs instead of take the elevator. It's no different than like doing the hard workout, um, than having the hard conversation rather than just avoiding it and putting it off for forever because it's difficult. Those things, like when you are willing to embrace the voluntary hard things, you become better when the involuntary hard things inevitably come into your life. And we all know this, like we are going to face hardships of some sort that are totally involuntary. At some point you lose a family member, you know, your kid gets sick, you're sick, you're injured, uh, you know, you get fired from your job, like your company goes under. They're, these things are really, really painful and hard, but when you've trained yourself to handle that stress, to handle that chaos, when you've become anti-fragile and you can benefit from that, incredible things happen. Yeah. Yeah. But it's only through the training. I don't, you can't just expect, I mean, it's like, I can't expect to be able to go run a marathon if I've never run. Exactly. It's no different. Okay, so I feel like there's two sides of my mind and I, sit, I feel like I could sit with you all day and talk about who you are, like you on the inside out. And you emanate that and you're so lit up by these things. And then there is another part of me that if I'm being completely candid is I love how you're living life because of what you're putting out. And I see uh, your lifestyle choices. How, what an ardent fan you are of your high school sweetheart and wife. And what a big supporter, believer, lover of your son. What an advocate you are for your parents and the decisions that they made and how they showed up for you. And so I see this really palpable, beautiful, bite-sized, firecracker, lightning bolt content. And then I'm like, what's your business? How? Could I look at this, this constant desire to be in my purpose, to inspire other people, to create small ripples, and then say like, okay, but what is the back end of what Sahil's doing in order to straddle these two lines? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So I, um, the business side of all of this was pretty organic. So I worked in finance for the first seven years of my career. I was at a private equity fund. I was making lots of money. Things were great on the outside looking in. You like get patted on the back. You're like getting your big How bonuses. How old were you around this time? Um, that was from 2014 to 20. I was like 
23 until I was 30. Okay. Um, wow. I'm 33 today. I just turned 33. Um, and things were great, right? Like I was making millions of dollars at an age when people are just getting started in their career in life. And so on the outside looking in, everything was great. On the inside, I was pretty miserable. Um, and I didn't show that to the world. I hid a lot from the world. I was very insecure. I was overweight. I was stressed. My relationship with my wife had really suffered. Um, you know, I was like not present with my parents, with friends. Um, there were just a lot of areas in my life that really were strained by the fact that I was chasing this like singular scoreboard of trying to make more and more money. Yeah. And I thought that was right. I thought that that was like what success looked like. I was like, oh, things are great. Well, why don't I feel good on the inside? Like, why are things actually not working? Um, and I realized I had to make a change. Uh, and so, you know, I had one conversation with a friend that really changed my life. I sat down with this old friend, not really a super close friend either. And he asked how I was doing. And I said, it's getting hard being so far away from, from my parents. We were living in California at the time. My parents were uh, in the Boston area. And he said, how old are they? Um, and I said, mid sixties. He said, how often do you see them? I said, once a year. And he said, okay, so you're going to see them 15 more times before they die. And it was just math. Yeah. It wasn't like an insensitive comment. He wasn't trying to be rude. It was just math. And I've never felt a gut punch like that in my entire life. And the next morning I woke up and I told my wife that I wanted to make a change. And within 45 days, I left my job. We sold our house in California and we bought a house on the East Coast to move back. And that was really the like start of this journey of my life um, into building something different, into like finding a whole different path. The business side of that, well, to if actually- If we go back, yeah. you leave finance within 45 days, your wife is thumbs upping a move across the United States. Yeah. Do you know what you're gonna do? So I had started writing just like casually on Twitter about a year before that. I had 500 followers on Twitter, but I was stuck at home during COVID. Like I had no social life at the time because California was locked down. And so I'd started writing on Twitter. I'd probably grown my Twitter audience to like maybe 75,000 or so followers, but there was no business around it. You know, like I had a few little like side hustle type things that I was doing around it, like helping other people with their content strategy, but there was no real business. I didn't have a newsletter. There wasn't like any businesses that had started. And um, it, this goes to the point of like the power of having someone in your life that believes in you more than you believe in yourself mm. is unparalleled. Yeah. And when I went and said this to my wife, she had no reason to believe that this made sense. I was making a whole lot of money. We had a great house, like we had a great life, great setup. And I went and said this crazy thing. And she was like, all right, great. Like, and I was like, what, like, what, what am I going to do? Like, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have another job lined up. I don't have a thing. And she looked at me and she said, like, why don't you do this thing that you're doing now that you're like currently doing on the weekends, like as a little, what if you did that full time? Like, couldn't it be bigger than it is today? And I'd never thought about it. Like I just assumed I would go take another job in finance on the East coast to just be closer to family. Um, but suddenly you're like, Oh, you think about something in a completely different way just because someone else believed in you around it. And that was what sparked me to actually. And this is 2020. This is 2021. Wow. Yeah. This is, uh, like two and a half years ago, uh, May, 2021 specifically. So this was built out of Twitter. Just yeah. Originally Twitter. Tweeting. Yeah. 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 Tweeting. Yeah. For fun. Yeah. Tweet threads. <laughs> um, yeah. I, um, but after that conversation, I, I actually took a step back and I was like, okay, I'm not like the creator mindset in general is like, how do I get every dollar right now? It's like, all right, I'm gonna get this brand deal. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do this sponsored mm -hmm. post. I'm gonna do this ad. I'm gonna sell this course. I'm gonna do all these things. And my whole perspective from the get go was, I think in decades, it's just how I've always thought. Like I think in at a minimum 10 year time horizons and I can't do that for 10 plus years. Like I can't possibly, there's just no precedent for like getting ad brand deals like over, it's all hand to mouth, right? Like yes. you're getting paid. Yeah, you yeah, might yeah. make a lot of money right now, 
but that can't feed my family for 20 years, 30 years, whatever. That's not like, there's nothing real there. And so from the get go, my mindset was, what is the actual business you can build that is decades long, that like lasts beyond you needing to create a new piece of content on a daily basis? Uh, and my whole idea around that was like, let me look at my own p &L. Like, let me look at the things that I'm spending money on as I'm building this. And how can I actually turn those into profit centers rather than cost centers? Mm -hmm. So Amazon, Jeff Bezos is the most famous example of this. They had to build out all of this like internal compute and server power at Amazon in order to function as an e-commerce business. They built that out and then realized it was extraordinarily valuable to other companies that would rent it from them. So that was Amazon Web Services mm -hmm. that they started selling the server capacity to other companies. And now that is like a hundred billion dollar business that would be a Fortune 100 company just on its own, completely separate from the Amazon that everyone knows. The entire idea there was like turn a cost center, this server thing, into a profit center for them. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do the same thing on okay. a much smaller pause? level. Can we pause? Yes. What Sahil just did is ask himself, what am I spending money on that I could actually make money with? I need to bring you around with me more often to do that. Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> I get excited about things. I'm like, ah, oh, no, 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 everyone understands like, oh, this. Because, because here's the thing. I yeah. am tracking with you a thousand percent and yeah. I am a hundred percent like AWS, let's go. And then all of a sudden I know that there is a disconnect between the person who's saying, oh, it's a hundred million dollar business. That would mm -hmm. be on yeah. it as a loan. And someone's like, <gasps> but wait, I'm trying to get my first million. Yeah. So what I want to do is just like, okay, look at your profit and loss statement and ask yourself, is there anything on this list, anything I'm paying for that mm -hmm. I could say, wait a minute, could I actually make money? Could you give us? I'll give uh, you good, examples. Yes, you yeah. are. Yes, so you are. The, the first one was I had built really like blueprints for myself of how to grow my platform on Twitter. It turned out there were a lot of other people that were trying to do the same thing. Now, you can monetize that via selling a course. I could create a course around how to build a Twitter audience and I could sell a hundred dollar course to a whole lot of people and try to make, it would be a lot of courses, but try to make a million dollars off selling a hundred dollar course. Or I could get high paying clients to pay five to $10,000 a month to have like a true service delivered to them, mm -hmm. done for you to like implement these blueprints around how to build your audience. It doesn't take that many clients then at five to $10,000 right. a yep. month to make a million dollars. And I hired someone to help run that to actually like build that out and operationalize it for clients and built a business around it. So something that I had actually kind of like created myself now turns into a business that very quickly I'm able to drive leads to because my whole platform, like whenever people ask me, oh, how do you grow on Twitter? You're like, oh, well actually this company that I own can actually help you if you're looking to do that. Is that how you initially grew this? Just by people asking you, how did you do it? That business? how did you go to market? Yeah, that? exactly. Just by people asking. I mean, it was totally organic leads. The beauty of a five to $10,000 a month client too is like you don't need many leads and frankly you can't service that many leads when you're first starting out but if you have eight clients you're in a million dollar business I mean it's like it's just not many clients at that price point and so you're serving like startup founders you're serving you know small business owners like people who can pay that they're happy to run that through their business because it's 50 ish percent off after you think about the tax deduction and it creates enormous value for them like yeah. having a platform on Twitter, on LinkedIn, which by the way, like I'm gonna convince both of you by the end of this to start building your LinkedIn presence because yeah. it's an unbelievable platform. <laughs> yep. um, but ha like for a small business owner, having a big platform on LinkedIn can drive millions of dollars of value into their business. And so they're perfectly happy to pay $5,000 right. a month to go do that. I mean, it's an incredible ROI. So that was just one example. I mean, the next one was like video. I was starting to post videos on Instagram. We were doing video edits. I was paying five to $10,000 a month to like random agencies and editors to make me clips from podcasts I mm -hmm. went on. And I was sending them referrals for clients because people were asking me constantly, yep. like yeah. who did yep. this video for you? And they were paying me $500 for every referral, just a one-time fee. And I looked at it and I was like, I must have contributed 50% of this guy's business and he's making $2 million a year and I made $2,500. Like, it makes absolutely no sense. Let me just go launch this business. And so we went and did that. We went and created a video business and partnered with someone incredible to run it. And we drive tons of leads to it. And like basically overnight, it's a $2 million business. Okay, I'm gonna pause here again. Yes. As you're looking at your profit and loss statement, what Zahela did is notice I'm spending about $8,000 a month hiring an editor to create video content. He's like, I also know I'm sending out leads 
to other people and I can look at the LTV, lifetime value. If he says, I've been working with this editor for a year and I've spent somewhere in the ballpark of $10,000 worth of editing, $20,000 worth of editing, what would it look like if I sent people who are in my similar state to somebody else and he could do back of the napkin math just based on the leads that he got on his own, multiplied by the lifetime value, he could look at a business. But he didn't just say, you wanna know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna build this business from the ground up. He decided to say, I'm spending money, I know I can get the leads, I know I can make money, what I need here is an operator. I need a partner. I need somebody who's gonna come in and do the things that maybe I'm not that strong at or I just don't wanna do. So Sahil is saying, what is an expense that I can turn into a profit center? What is my skill set, and how do I get somebody else with a different skill set to handle all the leads that I have been getting a $250, $500 referral on? All I'm saying is, look at this framework. There is something on your profit and loss. And here's the thing: you might look at Sahil and be like, "I'm not the person who's getting the leads, but could you be a partner mm -hmm. for somebody who is?" Mm -hmm. Cool. What you just said there too is a perfect example of a broader relationship framework of complementarity is more important than compatibility. And it applies to romantic relationships mm -hmm. just as much as business ones. But everyone is constantly thinking about compatibility in a relationship. Like, oh, am I compatible with this person? For a long lasting relationship, it's much more important to be complementary. And oh. to have your skill sets and your passions and your interests be complementary to the other person's. So that when you are drained, they're able to step up and be in that role. Like it can't always be 50-50 in these things, right? Sometimes right. you're at 10 and you need the other person to be at 90. Sometimes right. you're gonna be at 90 and they're gonna be at 10. And having that complementarity and having that mindset of what I'm looking for is complementarity. It's not necessarily compatibility. That is like a big mental shift I've had around business and my own relationship and my like reflections on what has made my relationship with my wife so strong is exactly that. So would you and I, I know that we're very new in our um, like peer-to-peer -peer relationship, friendship. We are more complimentary because we possess similar-ish skill sets. Like we know we can talk, get people's attention, guide people with leads. Somebody who would complement that skill set would be you talk, you get people to pay attention, you get leads, and I can offer operationalize mm -hmm. the back end. Yeah, my perfect example of that is my business partner in a lot of these businesses is, um, his name is Hunter. And Hunter has a track record of 10 plus years of building service-based businesses, like dealing with high ticket services, client-based businesses. He's done that over and over again, and he's ruthlessly efficient with it. He knows how to run them, he knows the pitfalls. I don't know any of that and I don't want to know any of that and I would <laughs> suck at that. Like I'm not good at managing people and I'm perfectly self-aware enough to say that. Like I, I don't need to be the best people manager in the mm -hmm. world. I actually, if I ever have like an organization within my like holding company that's like a hundred people, something went really wrong. Like I, I screwed something up badly. I don't want that. And so when I found that though, like Hunter is great at that, but Hunter doesn't have the platform I have right. or the relationships that I have right. with these creators, with the people we can partner with. And so when you bring that together, that's like the one plus one equals three moment that everyone is looking for in business and in your personal life and your relationships. How do you go about making those connections with those people? Because I find that usually the compatibility thing is the thing that attracts initially you mm -hmm. to somebody, like a friend. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, oh yeah, we have all these things in common. We've got this similar energy, mm -hmm. this similar vibe. So if somebody's listening to this right now and they're like, okay, I really need someone that has the thing that I'm missing to be my partner mm -hmm. in this business that I want to start. Where do they go to find that person? Do they have to be really super intentional about finding that type of person? How did you find your partner, Hunter? I guess maybe you can even yeah. use that as an example. I think, you know, for, first off, putting yourself out there into the world yeah. is extraordinarily important in everything that you do. I, I call it luck surface area. Like, basically the idea is you get lucky and people say it's luck. The reality is it's engineered. It's like engineered serendipity. You're putting yourself out into the world and by expanding your luck surface area, more lucky things can happen. That's by like going to events that you're nervous to go to. That's by engaging in online communities and discussions. It's by like publishing that thing that you're terrified to publish rather than just like holding it internally. All of those things expand your luck surface area. You're more likely to meet that person. The second piece of that is being willing and actually embracing situations where you feel like the other person is very different from you. Yeah. Where like they have an entirely different background or set of assumptions about the world, different perspectives, they come from like a whole different ecosystem and world, and actually opening up to learn about that 
and like being interested in other people and in other different worldviews and other different perspectives um, on business, on relation, on, on whatever it is that you're going about. Most people hide behind um, like sameness, right? You like, mm-hmm. you seek yeah. out sameness because it's comfortable. It's the most comfortable thing in the world is to just have conversations only with people that completely mirror your perspectives and worldviews. It's the safest way to live. I can guarantee that. Actually, you'll never have your worldview questioned. You'll never have your assumptions questioned. Everything will be totally fine until all of a sudden something bad happens and you're like, you're dead because you haven't had that like battle testing and the hardening that comes mm-hmm. from seeing different sides of things. Mm-hmm. But putting yourself out into the world with a broad array of people and actually embracing the differences that come, that's how you find the complementary, uh, the, the complementarity rather than just compatibility. Um, you and I were texting yesterday and you had said, you talked about the weather in Miami. I said, thank you so much for coming. And you're like, um, I'm going to dinner tonight. And you went to the dinner that Jen had hosted. And I've gone to her dinners before and everybody stands up and then they say who they are, what they do and what they need. Based on how you're thinking about comp- being complimentary and um, compatible, who was uh, complimentary yesterday? And what, how are you thinking? I want to get into like, what did you see? Who did you talk to? How did you get there? Mm-hmm. I would say most people there were probably complimentary. I, 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 I think I'm probably pretty different than most of the people that were at that dinner. There was a lot of like domain expertise in different unique areas that I know nothing about. Hmm. And I'm fascinated by learning. Most broadly, like what I enjoy and what I get energy from is just learning. And that's learning about people, it's learning about ideas, like that's what gives me energy. And so whether or not I like agree with an idea or whether or not I think it's like, uh, you know, an exciting thing to go about and pursue, I love learning about the thing. And so like there was someone there that, um, actually I was seated next to a gentleman who has gone super deep in like direct response marketing for his whole life and has like is thinking about how AI interacts with it and how it's going to change. And I'm seated next to him. I don't I know nothing about direct response marketing. I've never been in that world. I don't know anything about it, but I'm launching a book next year and I'm interested in like, oh, yeah, like is there a direct response angle on how you like so I'm asking him, like, how would you think about that if you were to launch a book? Like, what would you do? Like, what would be like the little hacks you would go about knowing what you know about direct response marketing? And so then I'm sitting there and it's like, I just got a free college lecture from like an expert on something that I never, if I didn't go to that dinner, I never would have known, you know, the one or two things that I picked up that then I'm sending, you know, I'm writing down in my notebook and I'm sending to my chief of staff, like, hey, we should look at this and this when we're thinking about the book launch. So that's just like one tiny microcosm example of when you open yourself up to things like that, you never know what that like one thing is that is going to be the power law outcome in your life. Mm -hmm. And that applies again, like it applies to business where you might find that like one person that you partner with. I didn't know when I was going to meet Hunter at some random event, but then we did. And I think we're going to build a hundred million dollar business together. Incredible power law outcome. But I had to meet thousands of people over the course of 10 plus years in order to meet the one person. Same thing happens to relationships. You don't just like stumble upon like the first time you meet someone. Maybe, well, maybe met, some people you, do. You I met my like, high school sweetheart. I know, I, exactly. So, so maybe, <laughs> maybe, I'm, maybe I'm a rare example of this, but like it's pretty rare that that would happen. Yes. Um, and you have to go out. Like you have to go meet you have to thousands put of people. In the room. You have to put yourself out there. You have yes. to like get uncomfortable. You have to, you know, uh, manifest it in whatever way. Like you have to have those conversations. You have to do that work in order to have the power law outcome. Like asymmetric things only happen when you took enough bets for the one asymmetric thing to hit. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you didn't know you were sitting next to. He is the considered number one. Uh, direct response copywriter yeah. in the entire world. I mean, I so literally got like no a free. It's pro- it's people probably pay ten thousand dollars to totally. have Totally, and you just got that. And that. so you never know. Yeah. You got to get in the room, and a yeah. lot of people, they they actually stop their own luck, right? Would you say that you've you've seen that a lot, where yeah. people just they they have an opportunity and they don't show up for it because it's too hard or because they they feel too uncomfortable? Yeah, I think there's a lot of. Um, Look, it's easier for extroverts. Mm-hmm. Like, mm. we're all probably like, at least to some extent, comfortable, extroverted enough to like, you can be in that room and you can be the light in that room that's connect. Like, you, you're there and you're standing up and you're connecting people and introducing them. And it's like, I am in awe of it and find it so inspiring because I'm not nearly on that level. But not everyone's like that. There are people mm-hmm. that are like super introverted. It's really uncomfortable for them to stand up and say what they do. And 
people hide behind that. They say like, well, that's just how I am. So I'm not going to go to these things. And what I would encourage anyone that's listening to do is to like, in 2024, just like push yourself to be uncomfortable a couple more times. Yeah. It doesn't have to be every single day, by the way. Like, you know, it's going to be draining for you. So it doesn't have to be every day, but just like a couple more times, deal with that discomfort and like go do that thing that scares the shit out of you. Go, go to that dinner, stand up, like do the improv class, like whatever the thing is that's yeah. scaring you, just go and do it because you really have no idea what you're capable of. The only way you find out is by putting yourself out there. It's by like taking that risk. It's by doing that thing that terrifies you that you ultimately figure out the actual boundaries of your competency and capability. And I just love, like nothing makes me happier than seeing someone that was like previously afraid to do something, do it and then experience the benefit that came from it. It's just like that gives me so much life and energy when I see that. There was actually, there was a woman at the event last night who stood up and said during her, uh, during her uh, intro that she was really introverted and she was nervous about doing it, but she was like lit up by standing up totally. and you could tell that like she was saying she was nervous, but she actually didn't really feel that nervous. Like she was getting energy from the room and from talking about it and she could see the people smiling and people nodding at her. And that was so cool to me to see someone that like clearly would have self-identified yeah. as introverted and that being a terrifying situation actually have this like new light to her and embrace the fact that she had like a real growth mindset around being able to go do that. I don't know if you've heard, um, there's this concept of neuroplasticity, which is like mm-hmm. the idea that your brain can actually change in structure and function on the basis of experiences. So taking on new experiences, doing new things actually changes the wiring of your brain. Your actual brain can change in form and function. It's the basis of this whole idea of a growth mindset. You can actually develop and change, but it only comes through action. It, can't, it, it cannot come from sitting around, planning, mm. in a room, reading, whatever. You have to actually take action on something in order to change how you operate. And so it's so fun to see situations where people are enabled to actually take those actions and to create those rooms. Like you're creating a room like that mm. where someone can take that one action that positively changes their trajectory. I just think that like that gives me so much energy to get to experience that. Okay, so a couple things. If we uh, go back a couple minutes, you had mentioned that after last night's event and then you met with somebody this morning, it's like you're putting these ideas around and you say, I carry this notebook around. And I have to say that I did a lot there it is. There it is. It's proof. It's proof. <laughs> I did a lot of creeping on who you were because I'm under. It, when I look at something, it's a curse. I walk into any place at any time and I look at the structure of the business. Mm-hmm. It's just it's something I can't turn off. So the first time I came across your content, I immediately was like, okay, well, this guy's amazing, very strong, understands his point of view, where he is in the world, what he's doing, and how he's doing it. And then I immediately went to like the business component. So I started reading your blogs started downloading resources, started listening to you on podcast interviews. And my number one question was, is this him in real life? <laughs> like this is a, this is a very unique skill set. So then the first time we've ever met was today. You walk in the door and you have like these really cool gold room glasses that my Miami, Miami vibes are drinking like, you know, black. Yeah. Put them on. Yes. I mean, that says the whole scene. Yes. Okay. The whole I mean, look. Look your experience. If you're not watching this on YouTube, you have to like, so we walk in and I'm like, Oh, Stanford educated. <laughs> baseball player, academic award-winning athlete that he is. And um, I'm seeing him being introduced to people, myself, and then he takes time for himself, sits at a desk, and starts writing furiously in this book. And me being me, I have no swag. I was like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm just writing down a few things, my thoughts, what I've heard. And I'm like, well, what did you hear? Like, <laughs> I want to know who he is and what he's doing. And he had breakfast with somebody this morning. But that wasn't enough. He said... I write them down and I'm like, okay, so do you just write them down so it's like hand, eye, brain coordination? And he's like, well, yeah, but then I take action within 48 hours. And I'm like, so when he's talking about neuroplasticity, it doesn't exist without action. Can you get us into your brain and then expand ours? Yeah. So what you just referenced is this like little rule of thumb that I have around this notebook. So I carry around, it's a moleskin little like pocket leather notebook. And 
the reason I have a pocket size is twofold. One is so that it actually fits in my pocket and I can carry it. The other one is it forces you to actually distill thoughts. Like you can't write long winded notes because the paper is only so big. So you have to write like little short, quick You're insights. You're writing tweets. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> yes. everything has to be like distilled, cut down to the, to the essence. And um, my rule on action developed because I found that in school, you were encouraged to like literally write down everything. Like you'd sit in a lecture and you'd like take note yes. on every single thing the person said. And then you're not listening anymore. Like you're mm -hmm. just writing and you're regurgitating, right? It's just like in one ear, okay, onto the paper, whatever. And I'm not actually, there's nothing there. And so what I started doing was saying, okay, anything I write down in my book, I need to take action on. And by take action, what I mean is I need to either think about it more, explain it to someone else, or like log it somewhere else as something that I'm gonna go deeper on later. And what that does for me is like anything I write in there now becomes cemented in my mind. Because if I, if I like learn about neuroplasticity, great, now it's gone if I don't do anything. But if I go talk about it with you and I explain it to you and I see, okay, how did Jasmine react to that? Like what were the pieces that she had questions on? What were the things that I didn't explain clearly enough? What was the way that I said it that like lit her eyes up? Now I know a little bit more information about the thing. I know where I need to learn more. I know where I need to like say it a little bit more clearly. I know where I need to slow down. That is like the incredible insight mm -hmm. that allows a simple idea that you wrote down to become this like incredible thriving concept in your mind that is now like connecting. Mm -hmm. It's actually like linking with other things that you have that are already on your pattern, on your map. Um, so yeah. Do you have anything in that book that you ever write down that's an action step that you know that you need to take that maybe you've been too afraid to take? And are there strategies that you use when you're mm. really afraid to do something? Like, let's say there's like a big action in there and you're like, man, I'm scared of this. And here's the strategy that I'm gonna mm. use to take action even though I'm afraid. Because I know a lot of people listening are probably thinking, okay, well, I need an actual tangible strategy to just start and take that first action step because it scares me so much that I just keep putting it off to the next day and the next day and the next yeah. day. Usually fears, of action or because of the size of the thing that you're acting on, at least in my experience, yeah. it's usually like that thing is so big, like my goal is so big that I, I mean, it's paralyzing. It's like, um, this is a silly example, but there's this concept called um, Buridan's ass. It's about this donkey um, that's like between two pails of water. It's like right in between. And because it's the same distance from each bale of water, it can't decide which bale to go to. So it dies of thirst. So it's like the rational thing would just be to drink one of the bales of water, but you get completely paralyzed by like trying to make the perfect decision mm -hmm. that you just get stuck and you die. And the biggest thing that always helps me, I'm going through this right now with my book project, is you have to deconstruct it down to the tiniest, simplest first step. And it sounds cliche, but it just plain works. Like I, undertaking this book, I wrote the whole draft, I got it done, it was with my editor, came back to me. You know, I hadn't written the draft and it, it, at that point, like there were parts of the book that I'd written six months before and I'm going through and reading it again as I'm making the next round of edits and I'm looking at it and I'm like, this isn't a, you know, nip and tuck edit. Like this is a war. Like I need to cut mass, like there is stuff that I can't believe I wrote that. Like I'm a different writer now than I was. That is terrible. Like I looked at it and I was like, this isn't going to be a simple process. This is going to be absolute war going through and editing this. And it paralyzed me like for two days. I was just like, I can't even open the document because I didn't know like, the first step was so intimidating of mm -hmm, even yes. acknowledging yeah. how much work there was going to be to get this to a point where I felt good about it. And I sat down and I was like, okay, well, what is the single first thing I need to do? It's like, okay, well, there's that one part. Let me just go and like write down bullets, a couple of ideas that would like bring that actual narrative line together. And so I went and did that. And then when I went back into the document, I was like, oh, I've already done the bullets. Like, let me see if I can just like flesh that out into sentences. And now all of a sudden you're like, okay, now I'm making forward progress. Mm -hmm. There's like the big thing now feels more like a little puzzle where I'm like sticking little pieces into it than the like massive expanse of, I don't know what it looks like. Mm. Did you ever do puzzles when you were a kid or like Legos or anything yeah. like that? I always loved like puzzles where it was like this enormous puzzle you're looking at and you're like, how the fuck am I ever going to start doing this? It's like insane puzzle. And then you go create the outline or you create the one right. corner. You're like, oh, well now I can kind of see it. Like now yes. I have a little bit of a dopamine hit because yes. I've gotten a few of these things in place. Now I'm starting to feel like a winner. Now I'm starting to make positive movements in the right direction on it. 
And so it's like, it's creating that. It's mm -hmm. like, how do I create the corner of it? Yeah. To use the puzzle analogy in whatever it is that I'm afraid of doing. And it, but it, it requires thought. Like you have to sit down and think about like, what is the tiny action that is going to start moving this in the right direction. But if you can do that, if you deconstruct it a little bit, it makes a huge difference. Get that little win. The that's, tiny, what, that's what creates the momentum. I mean, the winning win. sensation is undefeated. Mm -hmm. Like that little mm -hmm. feeling of a win. I, it's why I had a, um, this is recent. I had a 24-year-old young man reached out to me who was upset with where he was in life and asking me for advice about how to improve his standing in life. And I replied and said, for the next two weeks, wake up at 5 a.m. and work out. And he replied. He was like, that's not really business. I'm looking for how to make more money. I need to like improve mm -hmm. my life. I was like, trust me, just do that. Mm -hmm. And the point I was making was one of the biggest reasons you're unhappy with where you are in life is because you don't feel like a winner. Yeah. And if you can change that, mm -hmm. you can start to change a whole lot. And this is not like energy, woo woo. It's, it's very real. Like if you can get up early and go work out for two straight weeks, you convince yourself in some small way that you are a winner, that you did the hard thing that you said you were gonna do. And when you do that, that has ripple effects into every area of your life. Cause then you're going and you're sitting down at your desk. You're like, oh man, like, no, I'm actually a winner. I'm so mm -hmm. like, I got up and I did this. I focused, now I can do this. You're going and eating and you're like, I'm gonna eat healthier cause I just worked out. Why yeah. would I, why would I not? I'm gonna go to sleep at the right time. I'm gonna wake up at the right time. Like all of the things in your life start to fall into place when you create the one positive thing that makes you self identify as a winner. Um, so doing that, like whatever that thing is, that's going to start that little winning momentum will completely change your life. Can I talk to you about that winner's mindset and how you said getting that win, like there's nothing better than it. And so I know you have a son who's adorable and, um, by following your stories, you need to find him the perfect plush animal <laughs> to take home. Every new city, you take him a plush animal. And so I know that you, in the past, you talked about playing baseball at Stanford and then you got to the end of your career um, due to an injury and your dad played a very integral role to watching you play succeed. And then as you transitioned into other athletic endeavors, mm -hmm. your dad being there with you, when you look at your son and you try to build a winner's mindset, mm -hmm. what did you learn from your dad that you would want to share with your son? Oh, there's so much. Um, I, I have a really amazing relationship with my dad. Um, it really goes back to his relationship with his dad. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, in general, think that we either amplify or reject what we feel like we had with our parents mm -hmm. in how we interact with our kids. It's one way or the other. You either like amplify the incredible things that you feel like you had or you reject how you feel like you, trauma was created in you. And um, unfortunately, my dad was on the bad side of this where um, his father did not accept that he wanted to marry my mom. Um, my mom's from India, uh, and my dad is white and his dad was not accepting of that fact and told him he had to choose between him or her. And he walked out the door and never saw him again his whole wow. life. Uh, to this day, I've, I never met my dad's father. He passed away. I've never met his mother. He has siblings. I've never met, um, full separation from the family. Um, what an incredible faith of his love in my mother. Mm -hmm. Um, which has been a you know role model of like a loving marital relationship for as many years as they've been together. They just had their 40th wedding anniversary. Um, but my dad's relationship with me, I think, was so informed by what he felt he was lacking with his father. And as a result, he was so unwaveringly supportive of anything that I wanted to pursue. He was always the first person to be taking me to my lessons, taking me to my games, supporting whatever it is that I was excited about. And you mentioned it when I had to retire from baseball, the hardest call in the world was calling my dad. I knew that I couldn't play anymore. Like I was fine with it. I had come to terms with it. It sucked, but I was like, you know it, right? Like it, it's just not going to happen. But calling him and telling him that so much of our relationship was grounded in this sport and in what we had built. And all he said on the phone was like, I don't care whatever you do next, I'm going to be there to support you. Mm. Sorry. Um, and this past year, I went and ran a, a marathon. It's like a silly example of this. But I went and ran a marathon 
and uh, he surprised me, flew out. And it was just such an amazing example to me of like, he truly lived by that. It was not, it wasn't words. It wasn't just words. It wasn't just something that he had said. It wasn't on paper. It was how he actually was going to live. You know, the whole idea of like, what you say as a human being is fine, but ultimately you're going to be defined by your actions. And so as I think about the lesson for myself with my own son, it's that, like, I want to just be there to support him in whatever it is that he's getting excited about. Like, I don't care if he loves baseball. I don't care if he loves drama, if he loves ballet, like whatever the thing is that he's getting excited about, I want to be his cheerleader. I want to be there in the front row and be there to support him in what that is. And at the end of the day, like what more can you ask for in a parent than that? It's like someone to be there to support you in whatever your endeavors are, win or lose. Um, I guess part of what led me to that question is um, being able to see as a parent myself to, could I love myself the way I love my daughter? And when I see a model of your father, the way that he showed up for you, and then I see a model of how you show up for your son, and the way, the way I want to show up for my daughter, I ask myself, as entrepreneurs, parents or not, could we not extend the same amount of love and support and grace as we pursue our own endeavors? So maybe you don't have a supportive parent, and then the big thing that I've pulled away is we create positive ripples by standing in our purpose and having encouraging people to take a 1% to make a 1% change. And we've seen that modeled through Sawhill. We've seen it narrated through Sawhill. We've seen Jen ask really great, amazing follow-up questions. But at the end of the day, the biggest takeaway for me is to extend the same amount of grace that I've seen other powerful parents do it. And then the way that I would like to show up for my child and the big push for me in 2024 is can I love myself and encourage myself to pursue those things that I want to. Um, Sahil, uh, you're a powerful human being. You have opened yourself to your business, the way that you think, you encourage us. And I think that many of us listening are gonna make more than a 1% change. Mm -hmm. For people who would like to join that uh, journey, where do people go to connect with you? Best place is probably my newsletter, sahilbloom.com. You can find everything there. Fortunately, having a weird name, it's pretty easy to find. S-A-H-I-L, <laughs> so, yeah. Bloom. And um, on that note, I wasn't going to say anything, but he mentioned the newsletter. When did you start building your newsletter? May of 2021. May of 2021. And it now has over 600,000 600, subscribers. Something, yeah, I mean, like... Pushing 700,000. Push, push, okay, yeah. so by the time this thing drops, it's going to be well over um, 700. And I think that is a, a testament of showing what it means to fall in love with something and pursue that journey and make 1% changes at getting better every time he sends a newsletter. If you want to be on that journey, sahilbloom.com. And be sure to follow him, Twitter, where it all began, Instagram, where it's still going on. Uh, it is an honor and it is a privilege. If you found this episode inspiring, be sure to tag Sahil, Jen underscore Gottlieb, and your girl, Jasmine Starr. Like always, it's an honor and privilege. Thank you for listening to the Jasmine Starr Show.